Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is still Aaron Klein. I'm still a fellow in economic studies and policy director on the Center for Regulation and Markets, and it is still a rainy Wednesday afternoon, and you all are still in the room. So thank you for choosing to spend your time with us discussing what I think is a very important issue precisely because it is not a topical issue, which is what to do and whether we are prepared to and have incorporated the lessons from the prior recession on what to do should a domestic but still large, not giant, not one of these globally systemically important financial institutions, but a large and important domestic institution run into trouble. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk about it now, and I'm so thrilled that we're joined by and to receive the wisdom from many of our speakers now when everything looks fine. And I'm going to start by asking everybody here to kind of to introduce the topic, a question which was, what was the first year in American history in which not a single bank failed? The answer to that question may surprise you. It was not until 2005 that America experienced a calendar year without a single bank failure. In fact, from the period of 2004 to 2007, for 32 months, not a single bank failed. It was the longest period like that in American history, featuring not one but two years without a single bank failure. At the time, I can recall uh, many bank regulators talking about what a successful job we'd been and how wonderful the banking system in the United States was, as evidenced by no bank failures. I think all of us in the room can appreciate that 2005 and 2006 were not the apex of safety and stability in the U.S. financial system. Uh, it remained that way. In fact, 2000, uh, after the great crisis, uh, between 2013 and 2017, a small uh, but a decent number of banks failed every year. I define this as less than 25. 2018, however, marked only the third year in American history when not a single financial institution failed. Uh, and there was, has been one failure so far in 2019 of a bank. I won't get into its exact root causes of failure, but it was just one, and it seemed like it was tremendous amounts of fraud. Uh, and so it is, I think, precisely during the period in which all institutions are seemingly doing well together that it's important to consider, are we prepared for a scenario in which many institutions, particularly some that are sizable, are not? And I can think of no better person to lead us in that conversation than Martin Gruenberg. Uh, Marty has been at the FDIC board serving as chairman, vice chairman, currently a member of the board uh, for 14 years now. Uh, prior to that, uh, Marty was involved in every major piece of financial services legislation that occurred uh, for a generation going back to and through the cleanup of the last set great wave of bank failures uh, and the savings and loan crisis that spawned the reforms of Fiducia and Firea, which ultimately reshaped the agency upon which now he serves. Uh, prior to that, Marty's uh, distinguished uh, experience uh, in the United States Senate uh, and in the Congress. Uh, he's a graduate of Case Western and a, a fellow Princetonian, and Marty's career and his public service both in Washington and through the FDIC, fundamentally globally, where he's headed and served on multiple agencies to help spread the importance and value of deposit insurance and financial services resolution capability and authority in a global context, really embodies the Princeton motto of uh, service of this nation and the service of all nations. So join me in welcoming Marty both to Brookings and thanking Marty for his fantastic work so far at the FDIC as we hear from him uh, what we ought to be thinking about, about the potential problems in the resolution of a large domestic financial institution. Thank you, Marty. Oh, I should quit while I'm ahead, I think. Is Aaron, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, and uh, th there is a certain symmetry, I have to confess, uh, if not deja vu, because I, you know, I did join the board of the FDIC <clears throat> in August of 2005. And the FDIC had, at that time, gone through the longest period in its history with a bank failure. 
without a bank failure. And when I was seeking the nomination to the board back then, this is true. Uh, somebody asked me, well, why do you want to go to the FDIC? You know, nothing's happening in the banking industry. You'll be bored over there. You won't have anything to do. And I said at the time, you know, I don't really need a financial crisis to be interested in banking regulation. And all things being equal, I would just as soon not have a crisis occur if I have the privilege of serving on the board of the FDIC. And that was August of 2005. And then uh, 2006, we really had the first inklings of problems in the mortgage market. 2007, we had a full-scale meltdown of the mortgage market in the United States. 2008, we were in the midst of a near catastrophic collapse of our financial system, followed by the most severe recession since World War II. And I must say, there is a certain sense of deja vu when Aaron referenced, and we, you know, we did not have a bank failure in the United States in 2018. In fact, we went through an 18-month period without a bank failure until a small institution in Texas failed earlier this year. So, you know, you would think the lack of bank failures would be a uh, reassuring sign. I must say, for me, it's, it's as much of a red flag as anything else, particularly at this late stage of an economic recovery with the buildup of underlying risks in the financial sector and the possibility of a downturn, you know, at some, at some point. Um, I couldn't resist that, uh, referencing that with, Aaron, with Aaron's introduction, but certainly the subject I want to talk about today is relevant to all of that. So let me begin by thanking Aaron and the Brookings Center on Regulation and Markets for inviting me here today. The subject I'd like to discuss, the resolution of large regional banks in the United States, <clears throat> as Aaron pointed out, has received relatively little attention during the 10 years since the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Most of the attention, appropriately, has been on the challenges posed by the resolution of global systemically important banks, the so-called GSIBs. However, regional banks, which for the purposes of today's discussion, I'll categorize as banks with assets between 50 and $500 billion, pose very significant resolution challenges to the FDIC that are quite distinct from those posed by the so-called GSIBs and quite distinct from the smaller community banks. Their size, complexity, reliance on market funding, and uninsured deposits would present very substantial risks in resolution with potential systemic consequences. So I view today's program as an opportunity to have a public discussion about the risks and challenges presented by the resolution of large regional banks. Now, in order to establish a common baseline of understanding for our discussion, I'll begin with a brief description of the FDIC's resolution process under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, just to set the framework. I'll then discuss the distinct and underappreciated challenges posed by the resolution of regional banks and finally, I'll conclude with an overview of the actions taken by the FDIC to date to, to address these challenges. So let me, let me begin just with the nuts and bolts of the FDIC's resolution process under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act. Now, under the FDI Act, the FDIC has the exclusive authority to act as the receiver or the liquidating agent for failed federally insured depository institutions. 
Now, as the FDIC's resolution handbook describes, when a bank fails, the chartering authority typically revokes the bank's charter and appoints the FDIC as receiver. They basically hand the failed institution over over to us. The chartering authority is the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the OCC for nationally chartered banks, and the state banking regulator for the state chartered institutions. Now, prior to failure, the chartering authority notifies the FDIC that the bank is in trouble. There's, of course, a supervisory process that may already be underway to avert the failure of the institution, but for the purpose of the discussion today, we're going to assume that the bank will fail. Since the passage of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Improvement Act of 1991, for those of you in this business, that's FIDISHA, the FDIC has been required to choose the resolution method as a matter of law that's least costly to the FDIC's deposit insurance fund. This is a so-called least cost test. Now, as a general matter, the FDIC has two options for the resolution of a failed bank. First, the FDIC can sell some or most of the assets of the failed institution to a healthy acquiring bank, which would generally assume all the deposits or only the insured deposits of the failed bank, along with some or most of the remaining liabilities. This is generally called, and I'd like you to remember this term, a purchase and assumption transaction. It'll figure into the later discussion, P&A, purchase and assumption. Those assets and liabilities not included in the transaction remain behind in the receivership administered by the FDIC. Now, a second term I want you to remember, a special type of purchase and assumption transaction that is used when additional time is needed to market a failed bank is a bridge bank. Purchase and assumption and bridge bank. Although a bridge bank is not commonly used, it has particular application to the resolution of a large regional bank. So I'm going to come back to that as well. A bridge bank is a bank chartered by the OCC and temporarily owned and operated by the FDIC to, quote, to bridge the time between the date of failure of the institution and the date of sale to another acquiring bank. A bridge bank is established only if it is projected to be the least costly resolution alternative for the deposit insurance fund And before establishing a bridge bank, a cost analysis has to show that the franchise value of the bank, of the failed bank, is greater than the marginal cost of operating the bridge institution, thus being less costly than a payout of insured deposits. And this is where it becomes relevant, particularly to the regional institution. A bridge bank may be utilized when a troubled bank fails suddenly generally because of liquidity issues, preventing timely marketing of the institution, when the failed bank is too complex for potential bidders to conduct due diligence in the normal time frame to submit a bid that accurately captures the franchise value of the failed institution or both. These are the reasons the bridge bank option has particular applicability to large regional banks, and I'll come back these points on complexity and liquidity. If the FDIC does not receive any acceptable bids for a purchase and assumption transaction or the bridge bank is not the least costly option, then the FDIC will execute what's called an insured deposit payout, which is the second option available to us in resolution. In an insured deposit payout, the insured deposits are paid in full, and all assets and the remaining liabilities of the failed bank go into an FDIC receivership for liquidation. 
So since 2007, the onset of the financial crisis, the FDIC has served as, rec as receiver for over 525 banks. Only nine of these failed banks had assets over $10 billion. Nine of the 525. The overwhelming majority, over 98%, had assets under $10 billion. It tells you which banks have failed during this crisis and post-crisis period. Approximately 95% of resolutions conducted by the FDIC since 2007 involve purchase and assumption transactions, generally involving a single acquirer, assuming, near, assuming nearly all of the failing bank's liabilities. This resolution approach, particularly applicable to community banks, is generally the least disruptive, both to the depositors in the local community and the easiest for the FDIC to execute. Only 25 banks since 2007 were resolved through insured deposit payouts, reflecting the general availability of acquirers for purchase and assumption transactions for these smaller institutions, which were the overwhelming majority of banks that failed during and after the crisis. In only three resolutions since 2007 was a bridge bank utilized, and only one of those three cases involved an institution with assets over $10 billion. And this really leads into the discussion of the challenges posed by the failure of a large regional bank and, while, and why it is really quite distinctive from the community bank resolutions, which were really the overwhelming number of resolutions done by the FDIC in this post-crisis period. So let's talk about regional large bank resolution. As of the second quarter of this year, there were 39 banks in the United States with total assets between 50 and $500 billion. Collectively, those banks hold about $6 trillion in assets, or nearly 33% of banking industry assets. So they are a big portion of the banking industry in the United States. They hold $4.3 trillion of deposits, or about 31% of total deposits. And those, deposit, those deposits are held in 189 million deposit accounts. Now, of those deposits, 1.8 trillion, approximately 43% are uninsured. That's based on both the average and the median, but the average deposits from large not-for-profit institutions and individuals with large balances, such as retirees. The size of these institutions, by definition, <coughs> limits the you absorb. At the top of this scale, at 500 billion, likely only a global systemically important bank, one of the eight GSIBs, would have the capacity to make such an acquisition. So we are talking about a limited universe of potential acquirers and and remember, the purchase and assumption, traditional purchase assumption transactions, which are 95% of the crisis and post-crisis resolution, are dependent on an available acquirer. Given the limited number of banks with the capability to acquire a failed regional bank through a traditional purchase and assumption transaction, there is a significant possibility, if not probability that the FDIC would have to establish a bridge bank to manage the orderly failure of such an institution. In managing a failed regional bank through a bridge bank is a very different ballgame than when you have an acquirer. 
and would pose a number of challenges to the FDIC. Some of these challenges would also apply in the P&A purchase and assumption transaction, but certainly apply in, to a bridge bank. First, and let me just walk through these, even though regional banks generally don't have the extensive international operations and diversified non-bank business lines that characterize the global institutions, the GSIBs, many of these regional banks nevertheless have large branch networks, substantial IT systems, and millions of account holders. This complexity certainly as compared to the smaller community banks would make the management of a bridge bank a very significant operational challenge for the FDIC. As somebody who sat on the board, and I'm going to come back to this during the crisis, take my word for it. Second, regional banks rely to a greater extent on credit-sensitive market funding than smaller banks. They are thus more susceptible to a rapid failure caused by a lack of liquidity, greatly complicating an orderly resolution. Third, the sheer volume of accounts held by these institutions would pose a large challenge to the FDIC to make a rapid determination over the famous weekend after failure of the institution as to which accounts were insured and which accounts were not. And believe me, that matters. As of the second quarter of 2019, these regional banks had an average of 4.8 million deposit accounts with 27.4 million deposit accounts at the institution at the top of this range. A rapid determination and payment of insured accounts is essential for an orderly resolution. Fourth, unlike the global institutions which are required to maintain a, a minimum amount of long-term unsecured debt to absorb losses in the event of failure, regional banks are not subject to such a requirement. As a result, there is significant variability in the holdings of unsecured debt by regional banks. On average, these banks hold $3.9 billion in long-term unsecured debt, which is about 2.5% of total assets. While five of these banks hold long-term unsecured debt of 4.5% or more of total assets, eight report no long-term unsecured debt. So depending on the institution, a buffer of unsecured debt to absorb losses in resolution might or might not be available. And finally, the heavy reliance of these institutions on uninsured deposits would pose a very significant resolution challenge. As I mentioned, the most recent call report data indicate that on average, about 43% of the deposits at regional banks with assets between 50 and 500 billion are uninsured. Although the FDIC's resolution experience indicates that call report, call report data generally overstate the volume of uninsured deposits to some degree, it is nonetheless clear that regional banks have a heavy reliance on uninsured deposits for funding. In a resolution where there is no acquiring institution and possibly little or no unsecured debt to absorb losses, it is likely that the least cost test would require that uninsured depositors take losses. Given the heavy reliance of regional banks on uninsured deposits, Uninsured depositors taking losses at a failed regional bank could have knock-on consequences for other regional banks, particularly in a stressed economic environment. 
So we have two examples from the financial crisis that illustrate pretty clearly the risks I've just talked about. One is Washington Mutual Bank, and the other is IndyMac Bank. And let me walk through those two examples because they, they pretty well illustrate what I've been talking about. Now, Washington Mutual, which over, with over $300 billion in assets at the time of its failure in September 2008, was the largest thrift institution in the United States at the time and the sixth largest insured depository institution. Its failure was the largest in the history of the FDIC. Several factors made it possible for Washington Mutual to fail with no loss to the deposit insurance fund and no loss imposed on its $45 billion of uninsured deposits, which was approximately 24% of its total deposits at the time. First, there was an acquirer for Washington Mutual with the capacity to assume all the assets and all of the deposits, both insured and uninsured, of the failed institution through a traditional purchase and assumption transaction. Second, not only did the acquirer have the capacity to undertake the transaction, but because it had attempted to acquire Washington Mutual on an open institution basis, meaning before it failed, prior to the failure, the acquirer had already done the due diligence necessary to enable it to, to act quickly when Washington Mutual finally failed. This is really a critical point. And third, Washington Mutual had a substantial volume of unsecured debt, $13.8 billion of unsecured debt, 4.5% of its total assets, which was available to absorb losses in resolution. I got to tell you, the word luck does come to mind here because there was nothing, nothing inevitable about this. This loss-absorbing loss capacity was essential to meeting the least cost test and for uninsured depositors to avoid taking a loss. If these factors had not been in place at the time of Washington Mutual's failure, the FDIC likely would have had to establish a bridge bank and take over the operation of the failed institution. The failure of Washington Mutual in that scenario would have wiped out the deposit insurance fund and uninsured depositors would likely have had to take a loss in order to meet the least cost test. Given the stressed economic and financial environment in September of 2008, those of you who are around remember September of 2008, when Washington Mutual failed, imposing a loss on $45 billion of uninsured deposits at that moment could have had a significantly destabilizing effect. The only way to avoid that outcome would have been for the FDIC to exercise the systemic risk exception available under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act in order to set aside the least cost test. That, needless to say, would have been a very difficult judgment to make and illustrates the potential systemic risk associated with the failure of a large regional institution. Now, the risks of a regional bank resolution are illustrated further by the failure that occurred in July of 2008 of IndyMac, which was a $30 billion thrift. So IndyMac was $30 billion, 
Washington Mutual was $300 billion. When IndyMac failed, there was no viable acquirer. IndyMac's franchise value was pretty much zero. And it had no unsecured debt. The FDIC had to establish a bridge bank, impose a loss on $2.6 billion of uninsured deposits, which was about 14% of the total deposits of IndyMac at the time, and then manage the failed institution over a nine-month period during which the failed institution was partially wound down and eventually sold. The lack of public familiarity with the failure of an institution of even this size was enough to cause a local reaction and lines around the institution on the Monday after failure. IndyMac turned out to be the most costly failure in the history of the FDIC, resulting in a $12.4 billion loss to the Deposit Insurance Fund. So look, the lesson here is is pretty clear. A $300 billion bank could fail without cost to the deposit insurance fund and no losses to uninsured depositors so long as there was a viable acquirer who could undertake an all-deposit purchase and assumption transaction and unsecured debt available to absorb losses. However, a $30 billion institution which had no unsecured debt and for which there was no viable acquirer resulted in the largest loss to the deposit insurance fund in the FDIC's history, losses to uninsured depositors, and frankly, some reaction in the local community. So anyone who thinks that the failure of a regional bank is like a failure of a community bank is not paying attention. We have, we have real-world experience that was very tough and, and, frankly, enlightening. Now, since the financial crisis, the FDIC has undertaken a number of initiatives to enhance its ability to manage the orderly failure of a regional bank, including through a bridge bank if necessary, which is a probable, if not a, a possible, if not likely, scenario for one of these institutions. Since 2011, the FDIC has, by rule, required banks with assets over $50 billion to prepare resolution plans for the insured depository institution, for the bank, as a complement to the holding company resolution plan that's required under Title I of the Dodd-Frank Act. And these IDI plans are really quite important, particularly in the case of the regional banks. The preamble to the 2011 rule stated the purpose of this requirement. The rule requires a limited number of the largest insured depository institutions to provide the FDIC with essential information concerning their structure, operations, business practices, financial responsibilities, and risk exposures. The rule requires these institutions to develop and submit detailed plans demonstrating how such insured depository institutions could be resolved in an orderly and timely manner in the event of receivership. So first, resolution plans for the IDIs. Second, in 2014, the federal banking agencies adopted a rule implementing a quantitative liquidity coverage ratio. A company subject to the rule was required to maintain an amount of high-quality liquid assets that is no less than 100% of its total net cash outflows over a prospective 30-day 30 30-day 30 calendar period. This rule applies to bank holding companies and insured depository institutions 
with $250 billion or more in total assets. The Federal Reserve also adopted a modified liquidity coverage ratio standard based on a 21 calendar day stress scenario that applied to bank holding companies with total consolidated assets between 100 and 250 billion. This rule, like the resolution plan rule, was based on the experience from the financial crisis that the liquidity failure of a large banking organization can occur fast, very quickly. High-quality liquid assets, sufficient to provide a 30-day runway before failure for institutions with assets over $250 billion, and a 21-day runway for institutions with assets between $100 and $250 billion, were important requirements from the FDIC's perspective, given the risks associated with the failure of institutions of that size and the value of the FDIC to having an assured minimum time of preparation before the failure of such institutions. When they talk about a runway of 30 or 21 days, where do you think that runway leads to? It leads to the FDIC. So from the FDIC standpoint, having at least a little bit of breathing room before one of these institutions comes down is pretty important. Now, finally, in November of 2016, the FDIC adopted a rule requiring institutions with over 2 million deposit accounts to improve the quality of their deposit data and make changes to their information systems so that the FDIC could make a rapid and accurate deposit insurance determination to facilitate the prompt payment of FDIC-insured deposits when large depository institutions fail. This is job one for the FDIC, making good on insured deposits. As the preamble to that rule pointed out, and I quote, prompt payment of deposit insurance maintains public confidence in the FDIC, the banking system, and overall financial stability. The rule applies to 23 of the 39 institutions between, with assets between 50 and 500 billion. And I want to read this other quote to you. The, pream- the preamble to that 2016 rule stated the broad policy concern that led to its adoption consistent with the resolution plan and liquidity coverage ratio rulemakings. And this is the quote. While the likelihood of any particular covered institution's failure may be low at a given point in time, history suggests that the financial condition of institutions that are perceived to be in good health can deteriorate quickly and with little notice. In 2008 and 2009, several large insured depository institutions failed, including IndyMac Bank and Washington Mutual Bank. You can see the impact those experiences had on the FDIC. In general, very large IDIs, insured depository institutions, rely on credit-sensitive funding more than smaller IDIs do, which makes them more likely to suffer a rapid liquidity failure. That was from the preamble to the 2016 rule. In addition to these rulemakings, the FDIC has been focused internally on planning for the resolution of a large regional bank because of the risks I've just talked about. Now, if I may say, based on the work done, an area where additional rulemaking might be prudent to facilitate the orderly failure of a large regional bank would be an unsecured debt requirement to assure a comparable measure of loss-absorbing resources in resolution for these institutions. As I indicated, there is wide variability in regard to this among the, the regional banks. Now, unfortunately, instead of further measures to strengthen the FDIC's capabilities, there have recently been a number of measures finalized or proposed that would weaken or remove the requirements of these rulemakings, and for the record, I thought I should state them. In July of this year, the FDIC approved a final rule 
to allow banks with $2 million or more deposits to delay from 2020 to 2021 their compliance with the requirement to improve their data and reconfigure their systems to support the FDIC's ability to make rapid deposit insurance determinations in the event of failure. This additional year extended the original three-year compliance period in the 2016 rule, um, which took effect in April of 17. The final rule also weakened the compliance requirements that have been established to assure effective implementation of the rule. In April of this year, the FDIC issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking that while identifying the risks associated with large bank failure, nevertheless seeks comment on a number of proposals that would weaken the current resolution plan requirements for insured depository institutions. For example, alternatives put forward for comment in this advance notice of proposed rulemaking would reduce the resolution plan content requirements for these largest insured depositories, reduce the frequency of resolution plan submissions, and eliminate the IDI plan altogether for the smaller insured depository institutions above $50 billion in assets. Now, just yesterday, the FDIC board voted on two final rules. The board adopted a joint final rule with the Federal Reserve that would eliminate the Dodd-Frank Act Title I resolution plan requirements at the holding company level, with one exception for institutions with assets between $100 and $250 billion. And it would require the submission of such plans for institutions with assets between $250 and $500 billion just once every three years, with a full plan required every six years, rather than every year as is now the case. And in a separate joint final rule with the Fed and the OCC, the FDIC board approved yesterday eliminating, with one exception, the liquidity coverage ratio for banking organizations with assets between $100 and $250 billion, and leaving in place a liquidity coverage ratio for banks with assets between $250 and $500 billion that would only be 85% of the current requirement. Given the risks associated with the failure of large regional banks, these measures, frankly, are unwarranted and misguided. They only increase the challenges posed by the resolution of these institutions and the potential for disorderly failure, and they disregard the lessons of the financial crisis. So in conclusion, I want to again thank Brookings for the opportunity today to draw attention to the challenges posed by the failure of a large regional bank. As I indicated, I have been increasingly concerned that the attention that's been given to the failure of the global banks since the financial crisis, while entirely appropriate, may have obscured the risks associated with the failure of a large regional bank and permitted an unjustified sense of confidence to develop that the failure of such an institution would not be challenging. I believe the experience during the crisis of large regional bank failures such as Washington Mutual or even a smaller $30 billion institution such as IndyMac illustrates the very real risks a regional bank failure would present. Going forward, I believe that attention to this issue should be a top priority for the FDIC, the other federal and state bank regulatory agencies, and for the banking industry. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> In preparing for a set of questions in your speech, I was going through what some of your fellow regulators 
have said about this. And uh, Federal Reserve Vice Chairman for Banking Supervision, Governor Quarles, said the following. I'd like your reaction to it, or maybe we may know your reaction, which is he said, quote, most firms with total assets between 100 and 250 billion do not pose a high degree of resolvability risk, especially if they're less complex and less interconnected. That, 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 that isn't quite jibe with what I just heard. Yeah. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. When I talked about an, a justified sense of confidence in regard to the failure of one of these regional banks, I, I would think, you know, candidly, that comment would would, would fall in that category. And, and it's not hi, it's not theoretical or hypothetical. We had real experiences, and they were scary. Washington Mutual was scary. We caught a break. We caught several breaks with Washington Mutual. It could have been uh, another inflection. It was bad. It could have been another inflection point for the con- for, for that crisis, if it had gone another way. And IndyMac was, um, you know, uh, a really a huge challenge for the FDIC uh, in every way. And that was a $30 billion institution, not a $300 billion institution. If we had to do for Washington Mutual what we had to do for IndyMac, I mean, it, 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 it would have been um, a, real, a real, I was going to say challenge, a real problem. And so, you know, if I have one point to make today, it is... Uh, don't take it for granted. You cannot take, in some sense, we, if I may say, you know, we handled all these hundreds of bank failures during and after the crisis, we being the FDIC, you know, with little or no incident. And and I worry a little bit that we've lulled people into a, you know, a, a false sense of security. The The, almost all of those banks that failed were, you know, small, relatively small community banks under $10 billion. If we had to deal with a large regional bank failure with some of the complexities I've talked about, it's a very different set of challenges with a far more significant uh, set of risks associated with it. Uh, it's not that these risks are insuperable, but they need to be the f- focus of a lot of attention and planning and additional, uh, as I mentioned, resources and capabilities for the FDIC. So let's get into that a little bit because you kind of paint a little bit of a, of a Hobbesian choice, so to speak, that you can either have have a failure in a in a bridge bank like with what happened with IndyMac, which was at only a thirty billion dollar institution, the costliest resolution in American history. You can get lucky and have a purchase and assumption that saves the deposit insurance fund. But a corollary of that, that you kind of mentioned in your speech, but didn't delve into is, well, then the big get bigger, particularly when you talk about the upper end of the spectrum that increases concentration in the system and ultimately can't be replicated ad infinitum. Well, you know, frankly, that's why I put such emphasis in the discussion on the on the bridge bank as a tool here for the resolution because I think you know when we're dealing with one two three four hundred billion dollar institutions the FDIC can't assume that we're going to have an acquirer if anything for planning purposes we really have to assume a bridge bank scenario and so the the issue here is to get better and more capable at managing an orderly failure of a financial institution utilizing a bridge bank. I think that is the core challenge for the FDIC. And I think we have that capability. I think we've taken steps post-crisis. The resolution plans, I believe, are critical. The liquidity coverage ratio is an important liquidity buffer. Um, The um, ability to make the insured deposit determination and getting these institutions to develop uh, 
the technological capability to deliver the information in a timely way to the FDIC to, in, in order to do that. Those are really critically important measures to facilitate uh, an orderly failure of one of these institutions using a bridge bank if necessary. And I think we need to give some careful thought to this unsecured debt issue since it played such an important role um, during the crisis. So, you know, it, I would hope the choice is not a Hobbesian one. I would hope the choice is a manageable one, but we got to work at it. It needs to be a top priority, and we have to certainly preserve the measures we've taken to strengthen that capacity post-crisis, and, and we may have to consider additional measures. So I want to turn to the audience because there's some real experts in, in the room, but I want to also dig in a little bit on the resolution plan, which is frequently called the living wills, kind of a, a catchy turn of phrase. And some people make the argument that a living will is like your will. It's really important to do it the first time. It's somewhat, it's important to do after major life events, but you don't need to update your will every year if nothing big has changed. And that seems to be somewhat of the logic behind the rules that, as you described, change the time horizon on living wills. So how, how would you respond to that argument that, that you know, you don't need to update your will on an annual basis? Why should they update theirs? Well, you know, there, there's room um, for some accommodation there. I, th I think our experience with the living wills <clears throat> suggests, you know, going from an annual to a biannual every two years submission would be pretty reasonable from the standpoint of the banks preparing the resolution plans and the standpoint of the agencies reviewing them. Um, I do think for the institutions in the 250 to 500 billion dollar category, going to a three-year cycle with a full plan every six years, I mean, to me, that attenuates this process to an extreme and a full plan every six years starts raising a question as to how meaningful and relevant the plan will be. And look, for institutions between 100 billion and 250, the Title I uh, holding company resolution plan requirement has been discontinued with one exception. And those, plan, those 100 to $250 billion institutions are big banks, and those plans have a lot of value. So let's also, one of the things that flagged in your speech, you talked about the complexity of IT systems, and sometimes I think we think that when we see an institution of that size, it's always been of that size. But the secret in American banking is we used to have 16,000 banks. <clears throat> Most of, many of the institutions in that have, have grown through acquisition and organic growth over decades, which leads to some of the increased complexities in underlying systems below. If you had a $70 billion institution today and it grew through a combination of organic growth and acquisition, how big could it, how, how big could it grow until it has to create a, a living will and for how long would that last going forward? Because the ones that were originally captured from one to 250 at least had one before that requirement was removed. What does the outlook look like going forward in that context? Let me tell you, a $50 billion bank's a pretty big bank already. And uh, already pretty complicated with substantial IT systems, large numbers of deposits. Um, and uh, I would not take for granted the orderly failure of a, and the universe of acqui potential acquirers at the 50, 60, or $70 billion level is pretty limited as well. So we require plans at the bank level, at the insured depository institution level from 50 billion on up. I, I would not want to give those plans up. I think those plans have value and they enhance the FDIC's ability to manage the orderly failure of these institutions. Uh, I do not think the cost is enormous for the institutions involved, and the downside risk, based on experience, is, can be very high. I, I know we're, we could talk all day about this, but let's open up the conversation to...
folks in the in the audience. Uh, and please be brief and uh, identify yourself and ask a question. Go, go right ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, Neil Rowland, MLAX News. For those of us who are the opposite of experts, can you use some brush strokes to depict, please, the scenario that would ensue or could ensue with a bank failure, particularly if these institutions <clears throat> are not so interconnected as Vice Chairman Quarles suggests? Well, you know, the, we have the real-world example of, of Washington Mutual and the real-world example of IndyMac. And uh, had Washington Mutual failed, Washington Mutual did fail, but we had an acquirer that made an all-deposit acquisition, meaning all of the depositors, insured and uninsured, were passed along to Washington Mutual and no one took a loss. It was $45 billion of uninsured depositors. If in September of 2008, Washington Mutual had not been acquired, and we would have had to, we being the FDIC, would have had to take over Washington Mutual ourselves and own and operate it for a period of time, a um, couple of things. Uninsured depositors would likely have taken losses. The millions of uninsured depositors at other banks, I don't want to get carried away, but they might have taken notice that insured depositors at Washington Mutual were taking losses. And in September of 2008, were they, insured, were they positive their institution wouldn't get into trouble? And might not that have affected... Uh, uh, their actions in regard to their deposit accounts. If the FDIC had to assume the operational responsibility for that $300 billion thrift institution with a large branch network that was national in scope, um, that would have been a heck of an operational challenge for the FDIC. Uh, Washington there were a lot of knock-on risks that the failure of a large regional bank could have posed to the financial system, certainly in that scenario, and even outside of an extreme crisis scenario. Uh, the uh, interbank relationships of these large regional institutions, as well as the reliance on uninsured depositors, are significant risk factors. So all I'm saying is these are not your local community banks. These are large, pretty complex institutions with very large numbers of deposit accounts. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Bert. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marty, for your remarks. Um, you talked about what the, uh, the con potential consequences were of uh, Washington Mutual or uh, WAMU's uh, situation. But um, I'm wondering, when we take a look at even a smaller situation, I think of First Frontier in Greeley, Colorado, that was liquidated in, in uh, uh, 2014, had some serious economic effects. Are we possibly uh, at a point where we need to be realistic as a nation and politically uh, about what the downsides are of uh, liquidating uh, a, a large bank, and specifically trying to impose losses on uninsured depositors? And are we possibly at a point where uh, the federal government just basically has to throw up its hands and say, if there is a financial crisis, if there's a large financial institution in, in trouble, we have to protect, the federal government has to protect all of the liabilities uh, of that bank and not just insured deposits? You know, look, you know, that, that, that's obviously a, he's, the... the uh, Deposit insurance coverage is a statutory uh, standard established by the Congress. So in some sense, the question you're asking, if I may say, is, is, a, bit, is a bit above my pay grade. You know, the, the, the coverage was, as you know, significantly increased during the crisis and made permanent uh, from 100,000 to 250,000, which was a very substantial increase and reduced uh, 
the number of uninsured depositors. You know, it's a tough policy call as to whether you know, the, the, the notion of, of large depositors uh, not being protected is designed to ensure a measure of depositor discipline in terms of uh, placing deposits at institutions. That's a long-held value that really goes back to the creation of the FDIC in 1933. So I'm not going to you know, suggest that we should have unlimited deposit insurance in the United States. But we clearly need to be very conscious of the risks involved when you're dealing with the failure of institutions with a large amount of, of uninsured deposits because it, it, it does present a risk. Great. Uh I'll add as a coda, the increase in that deposit insurance limit wasn't a well, in my opinion, a a deeply articulated and debated moment. It occurred, for those who may recall, after the first proposal of what is known as TARP was voted down in the House before the second version was brought back. So the original proposal for TARP, which was voted down, did not contain that. And it was only after the crisis metastasized after the vote that then that was added by Congress functionally to get more votes because you weren't going to pass any piece of legislation without the votes. Uh, join me in thanking uh, Marty for his... Thank you. We'll start. Let's call up the panel. Come on up and, and take your seats, and, and Victoria Guida is going to lead our conversation. Uh, many of you know Victoria because you see her in your inbox when you read Morning Money in the Morning. You see her bylines and quotes. You see her presence on Twitter. I was recently talking with one leading policy expert in financial services who called her simply the best reporter he's seen out there in the world today in financial regulation. So it's our great privilege to welcome you to the Brookings stage, and I'll let you introduce the great panelists. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, <coughs> thank you, and thanks to Brookings to, for hosting this event. Um, I have three people here with me who have more than enough direct experience to dig into uh, the issues raised by Director Gruenberg. Um, I'm going to give very abridged versions of their resumes because I'm sure most of you are familiar with their work. Um, next to me is Sir Paul Tucker, who was uh, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England from 2003 to, two, I'm sorry, 2009 to 2013, um, and now he chairs the Systemic Risk Council. Um, next we have Jim Wigand, who um, experienced the FDIC bank resolution process up close and personal as um, head of the... FDIC's Office of Complex Financial Institutions. And uh, last but not least, we have Kieran Fallon, who is a Senior Deputy General Counsel at PNC, and he spent many years as a Associate General Counsel at the Fed. So um, I'm going to take up most of the time here, but I'm going to reserve some time for questions at the end. So um, I, I want to start with last week. Um, the Fed moved to ease some regulations on uh, a lot of the institutions that we're talking about, banks bigger than $100 billion in assets, uh, but not designated as important to the global financial system. So um, where I wanted to start is, um, Paul, I know the Systemic Risk Council has, has um, raised some concerns about what that proposal might mean. So my question is, uh, you know, do you think that this will affect the uh, – likelihood of some of these institutions failing? It will. So I think the Fed has made a mistake. Um, I th they've, what they've done is they've reduced equity requirements for some banks, reduced liquidity requirements for some banks. But then, as, as Marty Grunberg said, they have relaxed resolution planning requirements for a number of regional banks and have abolished resolution requirements for banking groups with total assets of between $100 billion and 250 billion. You, you, you frame the question, Victoria, in terms of does this increase the likelihood of failure? But I want to answer it in terms of yes, a bit, but also has it affected the capacity of the authorities to cope with failure when it occurs? And, and that is the single, in this area, that is the single most important question. I think that completely abolishing resolution planning for banking groups between 100 billion and 250 billion is a decision that no reasonable regulator could reach. And I'm, for those of you that are lawyers, I'm using a, 
test in English administrative law, and that's a gentler test than the hard look, look, hard look test that is applied here. I think the FDIC um, has it in its power to remedy this if, rather than following the same course for the resolution of insured depository institutions, if it, it changes course, and actually, as um, Director Grunberg aired the possibility of this, the SRC has, has positively proposed this, actually requires regional banks to issue bonds so that after the equity is exhausted, the losses need to go somewhere. That's the approach taken in Europe. This business of requiring so-called bail-in bonds to be issued only by GSIBs, that's a U.S. thing, and it's a U.S. thing that flows from the fact that Dodd-Frank had to be passed by the autumn of fall of 2010. And, you know, that was only two years after the that era of the crisis, and thinking hadn't developed far by then. So, yes, I think, I think a big mistake has been made, a mistake that no reasonable regulator could take in, in one part of it, which is, that's quite a big thing. That's quite a criticism. I want to make that absolutely clear. But I think this can be remedied and should be remedied, and I hope will be remedied by the FDIC. And I, the only other thing I'd say is that one of the things that surprises me, a bit on both sides of the Atlantic, but certainly here, is that office holders don't have the sense of fear which certainly gripped their predecessors only a few years ago. And I'm genuinely surprised by that that sense of, oh, my God, has, has passed um, so very quickly, and it, this is not in the interest of the American people. Um, yeah. So, so um, we'll just go down the liner. <laughs> uh, I echo uh, Paul's comments that the probability of failure has increased. And that's because, I mean, capital ultimately is the cushion that absorbs any potential loss that one of the financial institutions will take as a result of either a macroeconomic event or just the fault of the institution's management and idiosyncratic characteristics of its own portfolio. It, capital is what absorbs loss, and any uh, decrease in that will increase the probability of failure. However, that has to be balanced against um, the fundamental economics of the capital structure and the marketplace associated with the risk profile of the institution. So, um, you know, ultimately this is and has been debated for you know, years, if not decades, uh, as to how to balance um, those two factors. And, um, you know, to, the way you frame the question, Victoria, is that, yes, I mean, the probability will increase, but, you know, the question is how is that balanced against the risk? Well, there are other components. I mean, liquidity is, is certainly one which Marty alluded to in his comments that the uh, runaway to a failure is increased time-wise if an institution has sufficient liquidity to keep its operations going. And if that time frame is compressed, that one rate is compressed, then to Paul's comment about the regulator's capacity to deal with the problem becomes more difficult. Um, so liquidity in the resolution context doesn't necessarily change the probability of failure, but it does influence it. But really, it has a more material impact on how failure comes about or how, how it facilitates the ability of regulators or other persons to deal with the failure. Uh, and so that, that is an important component of liquidity. And then with respect to resolution planning, uh, it's a little surprising that um, an aspect of human behavior has kind of not been discussed or, 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 or really brought to fore about this. Um, and that is, uh, with respect to the process itself, the planning process itself, at the institutions who put together the plans, um, a, a really high degree of resources have been dedicated um, over the past seven years in that effort. And um, the people who work on those plans at the institutions took the exercise very seriously and had um, uh, great cooperation ultimately by others within the organization to put together uh, 
um, a very strong planning process and a robust product that the regulators in turn would review. Um, as you extend basically when those due dates come about, the natural tendency will be to remove resources and the people who work on that will be directed to other work streams and the organization itself will just by its very nature of not having to focus on it, not focus on it. Um, and ultimately the question is how much has that process been baked into business as usual processes elsewhere, outside of the resolution planning stream, um, such that resolution is taken into account as any type of changes in the structure or um, market footprint, um, operations, uh, acquisition plans, um, cross-jurisdictional activity, I mean, the list is endless, but ultimately is how much has that been baked into the process so that, in fact, the institution is going to be able to actually have um, a, a resolution, a capability to deal with the resolution, or the regulators have the capability to deal with the resolution in the event it actually were to fail. And so that's, that, that is kind of really something that's been missed. The time frame, people think, oh, the product just becomes stale. Well, it's actually... A, larger issue than the product becoming stale. Right, yeah. And Karen, I want to bring you in on this too. And I'm also curious uh, your response to, um, you know, Director Gruenbrook's proposal and um, Paul brought it up here too about this idea of requiring bell inable debt for uh, more than just the mega banks, you know, this this TLAC proposal. So, uh, you know, your response to, to some of the points they brought up and, sure. and what do you think about that idea? Sure, so I think on, on, I think theoretically you have to agree to the extent capital levels are reduced um, it does increase the probability of default, but I think it's a matter of degree. I think the the um, the proposals that were recently finalized by the agencies don't really gut what were the core capital liquidity requirements that were enacted after after Dodd Frank. I mean, I think you know all would admit, including my organization, that capital and liquidity levels were far too low before the crisis. They've been substantially increased after the crisis, and I think. These um, recent rulemakings, you know, fine-tune those requirements to some extent. If you take a look at the, uh, at least the Federal Reserve's estimates on this, um, their estimates were that the capital changes that were recently adopted would um, alter capital only about 60 basis points in terms of risk-weighted assets. And in terms of high-quality liquid assets, the liquidity requirements, the changes would only... Um, you know, reduce those requirements by about 2%. For institutions that have more than $100 billion in assets, those organizations would also still continue to be subject to the Federal Reserve's uh, Section 165 liquidity stress test requirements. So for many organizations, those um, requirements are themselves your binding liquidity restraints. For th so for those organizations, these modifications really wouldn't alter the amount of high quality liquid assets they retain in order to make sure that they have adequate liquidity in, in, terms, of, in terms of a crisis. With respect to resolution planning, um, resolution planning is important. And as Jim said, you know, organizations subject to those uh, rules after Dodd-Frank and, and those institutions, IndyMac and WAMU and Nat City, who we acquired in, in the crisis, uh, um, didn't weren't required to have resolution plans. That was a very fundamental change that was put in place um, by Dodd-Frank. Our organization, I can't speak for everyone, but I, I assume, have invested substantial resources in that. We've gone through several iterations of our resolution plan with feedback from the Fed and the FDIC as appropriate. They had largely reached steady state. That's not to say that there wouldn't be material changes in our organization going forward or at some point the credit cycle is going to turn. I agree with what Marty said. Um, when things look really good are the times that you should be concerned. Credit cycles come and go, and woe are the bankers that you know, always think you know, housing prices go up and your corporate customers are not going not to fail. Um, you know, we've seen this show before. We'll see it again. Resolution plans are really important. Um, I do think... The, the agencies still have the flexibility to request a resolution plan in case um, uh, 
the circumstances change. So that three and six year time frame that are generally within the rule for filing, at least for a triennial final filer like PNC, a full and targeted plan aren't hardwired in the sense that they can't be changed. The agencies can change those timing, that timing if it's appropriate, if economic circumstances change. And institutions actually have an obligation to update their plans if they do go, undergo a material merger acquisition or something else that would fundamentally change your resolution strategy. So all in all, I think, you know, is the balance there right? You'll have to see how things play out. I mean, if, if indeed situations get worse and the regulators don't exercise their authority, perhaps for particular institutions to accelerate those resolution plans, then I think, you know, I would, I would agree that would be a concern, but it's too early to say that yet. I kind of want to ask a, a more provocative question. I mean, you know, given what we were just hearing about Washington Mutual and um, basically how the stars aligned um, when it came to, to dealing with the failure of that institution, uh, I, I, I think I'm going to pick on Jim for this one. Uh, are any large regional banks too big to fail? It's, it's a very good question, and um, I think the answer... Uh, is, is one of looking at the um, context of failure, uh, circumstances of failure. Um, there was even a debate when Washington Mutual failed as to whether or not its failure would be systemic. And um, the systemic element of that was not the fact that uninsured depositors um, might be taking a haircut. We looked at that issue and were concerned about such a large number. So that was kind of a clear case. If uninsured depositors took a haircut, there would be a contagion effect in the midst of a financial panic associated with that because others would look at their financial institutions and say, I'm not going to take a risk. I'm going to withdraw my money. You would have runs. and Ultimately, that's what caused Washington Mutual to fail was a run on its deposits. That's what, well, that was the immediate precipitating event. Obviously, it had capital issues um, fundamentally. But um, any large uh, regional bank or regional bank, uh, if it were a standalone failure and in the midst of um, a healthy, a very healthy economy um, and a very stable financial system, depending on its degree of integration with the rest of the financial system and cross-jurisdictional issues. So you already, I'm starting to you know, build in some hedges <laughs> here. Um, might be able to, to fail without uh, um, being called too big to fail. Um, but if you're in the midst of a financial panic uh, and uh, it appears that uninsured depositors would have to take haircuts um, and uh, bondholders uh, might uh, have... Uh, uh, um, unexpected losses, and the key word there is unexpected, because I think with the TLAC requirements associated with the GSIBs, there is now an expectation that that will be lo a loss-bearing debt class, but I'm not sure to the extent that type of, of thinking has filtered down into um, the tiers underneath the GSIB level. Um, that there might be there might be cause of concern about what a destabilizing effect the failure might have on the financial system. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 a it's a difficult question to ask, but it is very very concerning that um, they certainly could put it that way. Seems like Paul has some thoughts. <laughs> so so my answer to your question is there is absolutely no need for these institutions to be too big to fail. But if the Fed and the FDIC remain where they are, they could end up being too big to fail. So my, the answer to you, you asked earlier, what could go wrong if one of these things? So this bridge bank thing, it's a euphemism. It's temporary nationalization while the FDIC, or in my country, the Bank of England, looks for a plan. And then the question is, um, when someone doesn't buy it from you, where do you put the losses after equity, after bonds? Do you put the losses on uninsured depositors? If you do, the grave risk, grave risk would be that the uninsured depositors of other regional banks would say, this is, you mentioned no interconnections. This is, you don't have to have direct interconnections. You just have to have similarity of structure. I'm a 
um, an uninsured depositor of this regional bank. I've just had my, my deposit haircut as to 50% or whatever. Um, that's going to be in the newspapers. People will take their uninsured depositors, um, uninsured deposits out of other regional banks. And so you would get contagion through the regional um, bank world. And in those circumstances, people that were elected, elected policymakers, they would, they would suddenly start thinking about how to rescue these institutions with taxpayers' money. This is unnecessary. Um, so they could end up being too big or too politically toxic to, to allow it to fail. That's unnecessary if ahead of those uninsured deposits, depositors, there are some bondholders who can be whacked. But as Jim said, that, that would need to be understood. The other thing that could happen is say that I believe and say that actually God's told me this is true, that actually the FDIC is magnificent at resolving small community banks, which it absolutely is, but also that it has credible plans for Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and, in my country, Barclays and HSBC, and say that's true, but that actually a medium-sized um, regional bank comes along and fails, and it's a complete mess, and the FDIC and Fed are revealed as not having a plan. No one out there, no one normal, is going to believe in the credibility of the resolution plans for J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Even, even if that perception, even if that inference is false, it would be the inference that people are, um, that would draw. This is why I say it's a terrible mistake. If you don't have a plan, don't quit planning. And they, and they have not, at the moment, got a credible plan. And I would not say that. I would not say that unless I had given the matter a great deal of thought and truly believed it. And I may be wrong, and actually I hope to God I am wrong, but at the moment I do not believe they have a plan, and so I can't for the life of me understand why they've quitted planning. And actually, the FDIC hasn't quite got that far for IDIs, and I hope it won't. Well, just to clarify, who doesn't have a plan? Because we have a plan. <laughs> We've been required to have a resolution plan, which has been reviewed by the, the Fed and the FDIC and determined to be credible. So, um, and how would you be resolved? Describe the plan to me. I, there, there's a public section of the plan, and there's a confidential section well, of the it's, plan. It's, it's P&A. But I do, I, it's P&A. No, it, it isn't, it isn't I bail-in. Do, I do agree with, with Marty that for a large regional bank, um, a bridge bank option, which is uh, uh, permissible under the FDI Act, would probably be a more likely resolution scenario for a large, certainly for a large regional than it would be for a community bank. And I certainly agree that there are challenges that would be presented by any large regional bank failure. Um, that is, you know, beyond dispute. I mean, it is look, PNC is four hundred billion dollars in assets. I, we're not we're far from the GSIB territory, but let's face it, we that's that's a lot of assets for a large bank. Um, do we think we've presented credible options for the for the Fed and the FDIC? And I, I'll, I'll say mostly for the FDIC because within our organization, 97% of it is in the insured depository institution, our bank. That actually reduces the complexity of our organization. It reduces the amount we have to you know, rely upon market funding. We're primarily deposit funded um, within, within the institution. Um, we've presented different ways to where we think the, the FDIC could resolve us through a, a bridge bank. I agree that the the opportunities for an additional, for a single acquirer to make an acquisition is reduced the larger the size the institution gets. Um, and you'd be faced with decisions that you wouldn't want to be faced with in terms of particularly if it was a US, US institution that was going to be making that acquisition. Do you want the large to get larger? You know, there might be a possibility for a foreign institution to come in that doesn't have much of a U.S. presence, but the, the, the range of options does get, get, get narrower. Yeah, so, so, so institutions like ours, we come up with, with different strategies that can be used to break the institution up through smaller transactions, through um, partial sales to different bidders in order to maximize the value of the organization so the FDIC can meet its least cost test um, requirement while still resolving the institution in an orderly way. Is it, is it perfect? Probably not. 
Has it been tested? No, thank goodness. I do think, you know, when I was at the Fed and, and Marty was at the FDIC and, and you were as well, um, the agencies ran simulations about how you'd run a resolution. I would strongly support the continuation of that and to the extent the industry can help the FDIC you know, improve and understand how to make one of these resolutions work. I think we're all in favor of that. So I, I was going to just um, sort of add on to you know some some comments that uh, uh, both Paul and Kieran have been been making here, um, and actually Marty alluded to it too. I mean, FDIC got really lucky with Washington Mutual because of the fact that one. Um, the regulators were willing to allow large institutions to get larger, um, even though there was a certain, um, you know, uh, it, it wasn't something that was a desire, but they were willing to do it, given the facts um, of what were occurring back in the fall of um, 2008. Um, but, and we haven't spoken about this, the market was willing to make that acquisition, that um, there were acquirers who were willing to do it. Um, given the litigation um, and the contingent liabilities associated with the acquisitions that took place um, during the financial crisis, and you start with Bear Stearns um, and the acquisition J.P. Morgan made of Bear Stearns, which wasn't a depository institution, but nonetheless it put on its balance sheet um, a significant amount of contingent liability risk associated with the mortgages and the operations of what Morgan, uh, what uh, Bear Stearns had. Um, I think there's going to be, unless memories of these boards are very short, there'll be a great reluctance to be willing to make that type of acquisition in the future without a significant indemnification from the government. And that would then require a high degree of political tolerance in order to deal with the value of providing that indemnification. And I'm not even going to speculate as to whether or not that would be possible. Um, so a PNA is, from both the regulatory perspective and probably from the market perspective, not really an option. So that takes us to the bridge bank option. And when we think of bridge bank, we should think of that in the terms of operational feasibility. And there are a whole host of issues. I mean, Kieran and Associate, I alluded to them. Marty's alluded to them. There are many operational issues associated with uh, a bridge bank. Um, but they, you can struggle through them. You might be able to, 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 to operate a bridge bank without um, significant knock-on or contagion effects. But the capital structure ultimately is going to dictate whether or not um, the market is going to have a severe reaction. Because ultimately, where the losses go and who bears those losses will define how the market reacts. And the expectation versus reality is a component of that. So if there is an expectation that you're going to bear a loss, then the market reaction is significantly less than if you were not expecting a loss and all of a sudden out of the blue, you say, ah, geez, look at this. My uninsured deposit, I received a 50% haircut. And it might be because the characteristics, the profile of that particular bank that failed was such that there's no way you could torture the least cost test to make it work to basically convey the uninsured deposits in a transaction. So, yeah. The capital structure is an, a very key component of this. And I do think um, what saved the FDIC uh, and, quite frankly, uninsured depositors from running at particularly the mid-size, large mid-size banks and even the larger banks to some extent was the fact that no uninsured depositor suffered a loss when Washington Mutual was resolved. And that was only feasible because of that $13.8 billion of loss-absorbing debt that buffered basically the equity loss and the deposit class uh, of creditors. Yeah, so, so jumping off this idea of, you know, whether or not there's a bigger fish, right, and whether there's a bigger bank that can, that can uh, take over the, the failed institution, 
Uh, one thing I'm, I'm sort of curious about is, you know, obviously one of the major trends um, in the banking industry is mergers and acquisitions and the number of banks is shrinking. And so you're ending up with a smaller number of institutions that are getting progressively larger. And, you know, one of the um, one of the effects of the recent regulatory moves could be to allow some of the larger regionals to get a little bigger. Um, and so I'm curious whether this just makes all of the problems that we're talking about even more complicated, uh, you know, to have banks for example, the proposed merger between BB&T and SunTrust, um, you know, that will that will wind up being one of the biggest banks in the country. So is, is this a trend that's um, good to have um, maybe like a smaller number of institutions to focus on, or does that just make everything even worse? I'll head off. I think, um, you know, I think the combination of SunTrust and, and bb and is driven by a couple factors. One is uh, the need for scale for technology and cyber these days. I think if you actually look at what SunTrust and bb and in indicated is, you know, the market is developing. Consumers want digital products. Um, you know, they expect everything to be on your cell phone. You know, they don't want to go to the branches anymore. That takes a lot of investments. That requires some scale. Um, so I think that is, you know, a main driver behind that. I do think, you know, I'm not saying you want to see, you know, those regionals become, become GSIBs, which would then, you know, create additional problems. But um, if you look at the deposit, deposit gathering over the last several years, um, the largest banks, the largest and most complex banks, have been growing deposits at a rate of about 20% between 2013 and 2017. Smaller banks have been growing it, growing deposits at a much lower rate. So you're seeing greater concentration just through, just through natural growth. And you see some of the GSIBs now um, expanding into new markets where they haven't been before. Um, JP Morgan and Chase have you know, announced plans to open 70 branches here in the, in the DC area. You've got Bank of America that's um, moving into you know, regional markets that they weren't. So the question is, do you want some counterbalance there, and how is that going to be an effective counterbalance? I think having a strong regional bank um, uh, presence, a number and diversity of regional banks that have both the scale to compete with those largest and most complex institutions in terms of des deposit gathering, technology, um, consumer-facing platforms, and cybersecurity, I think is a good thing. Um, I think, you know, I don't think we're going to see mergers that would form a new GSIB. I don't think um, the regulators, even this set of regulators, um, would be open to that kind of combination. Yeah, I, I think an important uh, element of the, of the question really deals with the uh, technological changes that are occurring in financial intermediation. And um, I've heard... Uh, and uh, the, I assume that it is um, the I mean, factual that one of the reasons why large financial institutions have been successful in organic growth is because of the technology platforms they offer customers, and therefore those um, um, technology platforms are, in fact, because they have the money, these large institutions have the money to invest in them, and to offer them to customers are, in fact, a driving force of that organic growth. And if that is the case, then you know, this is a trend that's just going to happen. Um, and I think Aaron started off in his very early comments saying that we had 16,000 depository institutions. I, I don't recall, Aaron, if you had mentioned how many we have now, but it's, it's under 5,000. Um, so over the course of my career, um, I have, just like Aaron has said, I've witnessed actually, I think it was more than 16,000 when I first started uh, institutions. But there are other countries where the number of financial institutions, at least large banks, and then you have the equivalents of credit unions or the like. I mean, the large banks are very, very few, relatively speaking. Um, you know, Canada basically has five, some say six, uh, large uh, uh, financial institutions, um, and it appears to, to um, 
have you know, managed that process you know, fine. Um, but um, consolidation is going to happen, and the question then becomes, does that consolidation actually result in, because of the other um, elements of re regulation, does that result in higher risk of uh, failure or a cost to um, the deposit insurance fund or society generally from one of those failing? And that's where all these other regulations come into play. <laughs> I, I think a fragmented banking system is, is, is better. Um, on, on technology, it, it seems to me, if you look back over the last 250 years or so in banking, that the really important um, shifts in technology that affected banking have been collective shifts. So the check and the clearinghouse or the retail end ATMs or the chips um, system. One of, the, one of the things that's happening so far, and we're only a few years into this technological change, is that most of the, a lot of the cutting edge technology seems to be within private institutions. My, my prediction would be that actually this will end up being public um, because these are more like public good type things than, um, than, than, than private goods. Who knows? Maybe it'd be different this time um, around. But I, I think it's a, it should be a matter of regret that, the, um, that some of the GFSIBs on both sides of the Atlantic are now even, are now even bigger. So I, I want to get to audience questions, but I have, I have one sort of final question that I feel like comes up a lot when, it, when people talk about you know, the, the large institutions that weren't GSIBs that failed um, during the financial crisis, you know, people talk about how they were sort of, you know, IndyMac was a, was a thrift that was just mortgages, right? And um, now you have large regionals that are much more diversified, and that should, should make them stronger from a business perspective. So um, starting with Paul, we can just go down the line. I mean, do you, do you buy that argument? Do you think that they're, that they're less likely to fail because they're more they're diversified? diversified? You, yeah, but you might need to, I mean, the classic case of diversification in the crisis is geographical diversification. It's HSBC here. Almost nobody loses more in the subprime market than household finance, which was owned by HSBC. HSBC didn't post, I think, even a single quarter's loss, and that's because of profits from elsewhere in the, in the world. Yes, diversification is, is good, but a whole economy can take a downturn. And this is not a backhanded way of saying, and therefore the regionals should become international and global. I think they should do what they are what they are good at, but they are a bit less diversified and therefore other things being equal need a bit more equity. They're a bit less systemic and therefore need a bit less equity and not all of these things should be, should be taken into account. But the idea that if you, get into, um, if, you, if, you, if you get into real estate as well as mortgages, real estate consumer lending, that that means you've suddenly got um, diversification that can protect you from a downturn in the, in the economy, that's, that's, that's not right. Yeah, I mean, diversification is, uh, is overall a plus, um, especially if it's true diversification and you aren't dealing with asset types or business lines that have a correlation with one another. Um, and you've, you're sort of eluding um, diversification when, in fact, there really isn't. Um, and that might occur, unfortunately, with regional banks because they tend to do business in a more constrained footprint. If, for those of you who recall the crisis of the late 80s, early 90s here in the U.S., um, it was really a series of rolling recessions, geographic rolling recessions that started um, in the uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, the oil industry. Uh, and um, those institutions were the first um, to, to show a high degree of distress. And it occurred in real estate, it occurred in corporate lending, small business lending, I mean, you name it. And it's because basically the, the whole economy, and it's a little like what Paul is saying, uh, he was alluding to on a national level or international level, but with a regional, it takes place at a, a, a smaller footprint. Um, so yeah, I, I think that has to be balanced against the, once again, the capital structure, which is really important, because one reason why IndyMac had such high losses is so much of its capital structure was secured funding. And um, that secured funding was fully protected, which meant that the unsecured funding associated with IndyMac, which included the deposit class, mm. had to bear mm. a high degree of loss. Mm. And so you know, the capital structure is, is very important to that. So I, you can't look at diversification without thinking of the capital structure of the bank, really. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I'd have to agree. I mean, um, I think most regional banks today are more diversified, particularly on the product line, than IndyMac and WAMU, who were really highly concentrated in residential mortgage. But I don't think people should take any serious comfort from that in the sense that um, everybody always you know, seeks to prevent the last crisis. The next one is probably not going to be residential mortgage. It, there's high degree of corporate leverage in the market today. So it's probably going to be a corporate-led um, uh, recession. So um, there will be a turn in the credit cycle that will put stress on bank balance sheets. I think we're better capitalized, have better liquidity, and are more prepared for that than we were in the past. But you got to be vigilant every day. So I think I can fit in two questions. I'll just get them back to back. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. We have plenty of time for audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> good mistake. Um, so, fake out. Um, and uh, introduce yourself. It's not switched on. No. We can hear you. <laughs> but the people watching can't. Hello. Hi. I'm Shakib. I'm a grad student from Johns Hopkins studying risk management. And my first and, and my question is, I'm trying to get a better understanding of are we heading towards another recession in, in like, uh, like in the coming years, or like what are the in your in your expert opinion, what would you say some of the indicators which are maybe pointing towards um, something like that happening in the, in the near future? Thank you. Um, yep. Wants so to so the the unconditional a long term average probability of a recession any twelve month period. As I'm looking across the former vice chair, Cohen, about 15%, something like that, I think. So recessions happen. Um, they sometimes happen after credit booms, but they can happen for other reasons as well, like the trade um, thing. I think the most important thing at the moment is not when the next recession will come, but that monetary policymakers have a lot less ammunition to fight the next recession than Dons and my generation did, because we started off... Um, both here and in the UK and continental Europe, with interest rates at around five. So we took them down to zero pretty quickly, uh, which pushed real interest rates negative, and then we expanded our balance sheets. But, of course, the central banks have already um, bought a lot. So there's this big debate be going on in town over the next few days about will people make greater use of fiscal policy, That bump, particularly in this country, that bumps into... But hold on, Congress finds it hard to reach decisions quickly and you know, it may reach its decision so slowly that it, you no longer need fiscal stimulus. And then you get into a very difficult debate about whether, well, can central banks do slightly more fiscal things, which that would be going too far away from the subject of this, but uh, that bothers me greatly because we don't elect our central bankers. So I think, I think the question that you're interested in, I, for what it's worth, in, in my former world, there's hardly a bigger issue and people don't have the answer. Well, and, and are there any dynamics out there in the economy right now that pose particular risks to, to regional banks in particular? Well, you, it's, if, you, if, you were, if you landed from, say, 20 years ago into today, you'd think, wow, unemployment's that low and, and um, participation in the labor force is that high and we've had that, this many years of uninterrupted growth. We're kind of due one. I don't mean that in a moral sense. We're never due a recession, but... Um, leverage um, going up in, in all sorts of markets. Asset prices um, are pretty pretty high. Equities are pretty pretty high. I, I don't know. Maybe this will be sustained for a, for a while. I actually, for what it's worth, Victoria, I ended up thinking it's none of these early warning systems work terribly well, which is why I ended up thinking it's preparing whether it's macroeconomic stimulus or resolution policy, it's how you respond when it happens because you know it will. And that having a policy regime, you shouldn't have your policy regime based too much on we'll be really good at spotting it next time because I, because I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, um, I hope that, but I don't believe it. 
I, I absolutely echo Paul. I have no idea when the next recession is going to hit, um, but there will be one at some point. And the question is how prepared um, are regulators and the industry to withstand it uh, and mitigate the effects of it. Um, the regulatory tools, that toolbox certainly um, has fewer tools in it now than it did before the last crisis, so that's problematic. Um, are the regulators smart enough to work around it? Will there be political will to uh, change that? Um, who knows? Uh, you know, that's sort what of is the answer to that question? question. <laughs> uh, but but the, I think the, you know, the, 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 key, the key issue um, for resolution planning purposes is will there be um, enough capital um, at the institutions, the GSIBs, for example, the bail interval, the TLAC, uh, capital such that it serves as a ready source to recapitalize the institutions because almost by definition um, a recession results in depository institutions needing recapitalization and that either comes from the private sector or the public sector. Yeah. And if it comes from the private sector, is it going to be available? And that was the problem in the last recession was that it wasn't available because during a, a period of recession, capital gets to be extremely expensive. Uh, and as a result, it's generally unavailable. And as a result, it has to come from the public sector. And the question is, will it be available at the public sector and what form will that take? Um, and you know, that was TARP, uh, or uh, a portion of TARP, and that's um, you know, sort of an open issue. So I, I the, generally you're great. I'll, I'll diverge a little bit from uh, from Jim's comments in the sense that while a recession is is inevitable at some point, and whether that's six months, 12 months, 24 months, your guess is as good as mine, um, I wouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion that the next recession will you know, require any, of our, any large institution to go through the resolution process. Mm -hmm. I think capital and liquidity is much higher within the system today than it was before the crisis. The quality of capital is far superior. I think we have something that we didn't discuss here, which is really one of the main benefits, you know, key post-crisis reforms was stress testing, which all in major institutions do in the United States mm -hmm. and in England. Mm -hmm. We stress our balance sheets now to see what would happen if we face a great recession. Will the next recession be a great recession or something like that? Hopefully not. I do worry, though, and I'll echo Paul's comments here, that um, even with a, with a more shallow recession, I do worry that um, we're less capable to respond today. I think the economies, both in the U.S. and in the, in the global economy, are weaker today than they were going into the last recession. I think fiscal policy, particularly in the U.S., may not be as available as it was in the last, in the Great Recession. We are already printing over $1 trillion deficits, and that's while the economy is booming and unemployment is at an all-time low. So you could see there being less flexibility on the fiscal side in the U.S. to counteract what will eventually be a recession. What do we think, two or three? Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you. Bert Ely, a banking consultant. I have a question with regards to the resolution plans that have been talked about. To what extent have the regulators tried to put together the resolution plans for, um, let's say, the 10 or 20 largest banking companies to see how they might interact uh, uh, during a downturn to, in turn, try to identify situations where uh, – too many resolution plans call for the same course of action, which almost guarantees a collective failure of the resolution plans. Yeah. Well, well, we, 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 can, we can take another question, too. Um, up here in the green tie. Thank you. Carl Golovin. You mentioned going back 250 years. I'd just like to offer a point of contrast. 1837, and as a reference, Andrew Jackson's farewell address of that year. There's several thousand words about banking and money. He'd paid off the federal debt to zero, and uh, the money was constitutional gold and silver coin, which there was a quantity that permanently circulated 
and so there is stability. Also, constantly more money being brought into circulation through the free coinage of gold and silver. So the Federal Reserve was brought into existence in 1907 or 1913 because of the panic of 1907 promising to end this cyclical period of crises. Um, do we maybe need to consider going back to a constitutional monetary unit with wireless technology, of course, allowing the velocity of gold or silver to be President transferred? President Jackson, of course, uh, was just 25 years out. before the Civil War. Um, we'll take one more uh, in the brown jacket and the blue shirt. <laughs> Stuart Brown, Warren Capital. So in the last 18 months, we had one croaked bank and an, a runway. Uh, and I'm just wondering how many uh, croaking aircraft are landing on that runway, and is the number increasing, or where, where does it stand, uh, banks that are not dead but perhaps running into trouble? Um, I'm also wondering if... Uh, FDIC is as robust as it was before. We've got a president who's not especially great at building up our institutions. Um, and I'm also wondering if stuff like the choking repo market and Goldman choking on Lyft and Uber and WeWork are canaries. All right, a lot there. <laughs> Jim, you want to start? Um, yeah, I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, the regulators keep a problem bank list. I, I don't know how many problem banks there are right now. Um, Thank you. Yeah, okay. So, so in the overall scheme of things, a relatively small number. Um, and the, the, the one takeaway, though, I would want to, to leave you with is that that's a rear view. That's looking in the rear view mirror. Uh, and I can't emphasize that strongly enough. I already alluded to his comments about no failures in 2005 and 2006, but the reality is all supervisory regulatory reports, when you look at something like a problem bank report, that's looking in the rearview mirror because those are examinations were done a while ago. And so you're dealing with a timing issue, and then also you're dealing with the unforeseen issue. Uh, and I think that's actually become a more material problem right now. I think we've done a great job of learning from our mistakes and learn what, that we're not going to repeat the mistakes, but it's those unforeseen issues that we really haven't thought about. A little bit like today's discussion, we focus on a GSIB resolution. We really haven't focused on, on this class of institutions, this cohort, and yet it very well could be a risk. Uh, and so that, I think, you know, ultimately is, is, is really um, you know, what need to, we need to be concerned about. So in, to the question about uh, what if a number of GSIBs fail together, if, if, if one believes that the bail-in SPE thing is, is a really great resolution strategy, which I certainly believe it is, but I would, um, you, you want to make sure that these bail-in bonds aren't held by other banks, aren't held by money market institutions, and if they're held by insurance companies and pension funds, that they're subject to um, concentration. Um, limits. You wouldn't want, say, CalPERS to be owning all of the bail-in bonds issued by all the big American um, banks. And I, something that I said when I was responsible at kind of G20 level for this, and I don't think it's happened enough, is ba bail-in policy isn't just for bank supervisors and bank resolvers. It needs to have involve, I've implied, insurance regulators and to the extent they exist, pension fund regulators, but also securities regulators. Italy had a problem because it, Italian households invested a lot in, in bank bonds. And all, all of this is foreseeable and can be addressed, but hasn't so far. On the repo market point, I, I think um, part of what was going on was hoarding of reserves by some of the big banks. This is quite concerning. This is, 2007 was harder to navigate because of hoarding of reserves by... A few banks here, a few banks in London, a few banks in continental um, Europe. I, I think they, I mean, frankly, I think that the mess doesn't reflect very well on, on that bit of the authorities, but they've got time to come up with a better system, and I think they, I think they can, and I think they, 
they need to. When you hit these crises, you need great resolution plans, you need a money market that works, you need effectively monetary policy system, and there's a degree of urgency about this because, going back to the earlier question, we don't know when this recession will come, only that, only that it will. Yeah, I think we're I think we're out of time, but uh, I really appreciate everyone for being here. I enjoyed the discussion. Hopefully, you all did as well. Aaron, is there anything? Uh,